enjoy uh, the food while it's still out. Grab yourself a plate of food, find a seat. My name is Felicity Kirby. I'm the survivorship coordinator at GBMC. And I'd like to just make a few little remarks before we get going. Am I too loud? It's okay. So we would like to start this program on time today at 1 o'clock because we are going to be streaming at Facebook Live, which is a new experience for us, and that is with the camera with the bright light is in the back. So what this means is if you are on social media, Facebook, you can go on later to GBMC's Facebook site and you can see the program. It will be recorded and then replayed whenever you want to visit their site and watch it. I'd like to start out with thanking all of the contributors. If you look in your program on the left, they're listed out, and we really could not have this program without their generous. very important announcement too. If you haven't visited the raffle table and gotten your ticket, you might want to do that. We'll be drawing the raffle prizes at the end and we have lots of fun things. And I imagine you've all visited the legacy information table when you came in. Um, thank you for doing that. That's our next big party in the fall. And one other thing the GBMC social media department has asked me is if you take any pictures that you'd like to share, if you share them with hashtag GBMC, then uh, they will go on the GBMC Facebook site or out on Instagram. Is Dr. Dunnigan in the house? Oh, okay. All right, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Dr. Dunnigan, Dr. Robert Dunnigan. I'm thrilled. Many of you know Dr. Dunnigan. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he is one of our medical oncologists, hematologists from the Sandra and Malcolm Berman Cancer Institute. He has been practicing at GBMC for more than 15 years. And this past year and many previous years, he is listed as one of Baltimore's top oncologists by Baltimore Magazine. Thank you. Good afternoon. I try not to have that feedback like you had, although it did wake everybody up. Yes. All right. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here, all of you. Um, Today we are uh, once again celebrating National Cancer Survivor Day, now in its 30th year. And at the Sandra and Malcolm Berman Cancer Institute at GBMC, we celebrate along with many other healthcare systems across the United States. And on this day we stand together, everyone living with a history of cancer, joined by our loved ones and healthcare providers to show the world that life with cancer or life after cancer, although challenging, can also be meaningful, fulfilling, and even inspiring. We celebrate life, we celebrate hope, we celebrate you. Now, before getting started, I'd like to acknowledge all the people in the room who worked tirelessly to make today's celebration a reality. So, how about a... <laughs> and we are pleased to be joined by many of the employees who have accompanied you on your cancer journeys together. Unfortunately, several could not be here today as they are attending the annual American Society of Oncology meeting, which takes place this weekend in Chicago. But we look forward to the added knowledge that they bring back to us from that meeting so that we can apply it to our jobs and help all of you further. Um, 
Let's also give a shout out to the band Don't Stop, who are not behind me. And especially to their lead singer, Landry, who was uh, one of our previous employees in the medical oncology clinic. So, Landry, wherever you are, thanks for filling the air with your, your beautiful sounds. Now, today in the United States, there are 15 million people living with and beyond cancer, and this number is expected expected to increase by nearly 30% uh, by the year of 2025. Because of great strides that have been made in early detection, prevention, and ultimately the treatment of cancer, there are now more people surviving and living longer after a cancer diagnosis than ever before. However, we all know that many survivors face limited access to health care specialists, inadequate or no insurance, difficulty finding employment, and psychosocial struggles after the diagnosis. Once active treatment ends, cancer survivors still must cope with the long-term effects of cancer, which can include ongoing physical and emotional side effects, and other health problems, and potentially devastating financial setbacks, something especially important in this time of shifting stands in our national health care system. But I assure you that at GBMC, we are our we are all very aware of these many issues and we are committed to maintaining and even improving our systems of care so that we can help all of our patients continue to meet these challenges. Now there was a passing of the baton last year when Dr. Gary Cohen retired as the director of the Berman Cancer Institute after more than 20 years of spirited and dynamic leadership. Now under the new and visionary guidance of Dr. Paul Solano who is currently one of the doctors in Chicago and with the support of Michael Stein, the spirited executive director of the GBMC Oncology Services, this past year has really been one of great change in our Cancer Institute, and there are more changes to come. We are now really beginning to see Dr. Solana's vision take root in several ways. For example, at the Berman Cancer Institute, we are very proud to be actively involved in the cutting edge of oncology through our robust clinical trials program. Indeed, our clinical trials program is the largest community-based clinical trials program in the state of Maryland. We have recruited several excellent people to our clinical trial staff over the past year. And because of that, in part, our enrollment in clinical trials has soared. So we are most pleased to be able to offer such innovative therapy options to our patients. GBMC is also part of a nationwide high priority initiative to incorporate palliative care services earlier into the care plan, especially for those living with advanced cancers. And we are fortunate to be partnered with one of the premier palliative care and hospice programs in the country, Gilcrest Services, in this initiative. We continue to embrace the use of evolving and new genomic testing or gene-based testing, as well as immunotherapies, things that I'm sure you see headlines about in the lay press as well as other places. And these are two important advancing fronts in the war of cancer. We are looking forward to further developing our programs for urological and gastrointestinal malignancies, and there are exciting new changes that are uh, coming soon. We are looking to develop our survivorship program further, as that is a very important initiative around the country. And our goal is to have all patients receive an end of care and survivorship summary at some point in their care. And as in previous years, our cancer programs continue to receive the highest quality marks from numerous accreditation programs. Now I say this not to boast or brag, but just to ensure you that there is tremendous work done daily behind the scenes to make sure that our patients receive the highest quality of care. Now we have many superstars within our ranks, including here today Karen Ulmer, a nurse in the Dance Center who was just recently singled out as one of the top nurses by Baltimore Magazine. All right, Karen. One of many accolades I've seen Karen receive uh, over the years that I've been at GBMC. And a little bit of a reality test. As many as you know, last October 1st, the entire GBMC healthcare system went live with our new electronic healthcare system. Audible groans. Um, but we really appreciate the understanding and patience of our patients as this new technology has emerged. Uh, emerge. Um, as was to be expected, there have been a lot of bumps along the way, but in the end we believe 
all of you will benefit from a more comprehensive, a more integrated, and ultimately a safer system of care. All right, we have a wonderful program for you today. We have a national speaker who we are very lucky to have traveled uh, all the way from Jacksonville, Florida to be with us today. We will have a moment to say farewell to some beloved retiring GBMC staff. And of course, the primary reason we are here is to acknowledge each of you, our survivors. Now, we have a little bit of a talent show today as well. In fact, many of you may not know this, but Dr. Neri Cohen, our thoracic surgeon, is a very accomplished uh, opera singer. And hopefully we can pull him from the crowd to sing a few bars from uh, the Barber of Seville. <laughs> and Dr. Chowdhury was a uh, college champion gymnast, and we're going to do a little uh, floor exercise here a little bit. We're going to have to push, push some of the tables back. But she's, I, I saw it in rehearsal, and it was really fantastic. So uh, she's going to do a tumbling uh, exercise program. And you may not know this, but Dr. Brooklyn is an accomplished magician. And a little bit later, he's going to single-handedly make Dr. Albert Blumberg disappear. <laughs> it's actually a slow joke. It's a slow, slow uh, trick. I, it's going to take about three or four weeks, but I think, I think you can do it. All right, and now for our keynote speaker. Our speaker today did not fit the profile of those commonly diagnosed with oral cancer. She was not a smoker nor a drinker, but a young mother of two who ate well, exercised, and received regular dental checkups. As a trained actress specializing in interactive performance pieces, speech and articulation were an essential part of her livelihood. Almost three years had passed from the time she initially consulted dental professionals about a non-healing sore on her tongue before her condition was accurately diagnosed. By then, unfortunately, the cancer was stage four, and she was humbly given a 15% chance of surviving. Oral cancer can rob you of many vital parts of living life, the ability to smile, to eat, to speak, and even to kiss. Despite her poor prognosis, she retained her ability to do all those things. She shares her survival story internationally to raise awareness and to save lives. For her advocacy in oral cancer education, she was awarded honorary membership in the Academy of Oral Medicine. She is the author of two books for children to make cancer less scary. Mr. C plays Hide and Seek and Mr. C the Globetrotter. It is my distinct honor to introduce our speaker today who has used her adversity as an opportunity to make a difference. Welcome, Eva Grazel. survivor from the moment you're diagnosed. I'll never forget being wheeled away from my husband and mother at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City through these large gray double doors. A diamond-shaped yellow sign read, no visitors beyond this point. Dressed in my thin cotton gown on a cold metal gurney, I was wheeled into my parking spot. Alongside other patients coming in and out of surgery, doctors and nurses were dashing around as I lay there at 8 a.m. for my 9 a.m. surgery slot. At noon, I called over a nurse. Excuse me, I'm so sorry to bother you, but my surgery is supposed to be 12 hours long, and at this point they'll be operating on me at midnight. Could we reschedule for tomorrow, please? Ah, uh, honey, she said they do this all the time. Now, don't you worry about it. Do you want a magazine? <laughs> and that's when I felt this frustration deep inside begin to erupt. Why didn't my dentists know what was staring at them on the lateral border of my tongue? Why didn't my oral surgeons question the first biopsy? I had nowhere to direct my frustration but upwards. 
well, at this nurse. I said to her, do you know I may never speak again articulately? I may never swallow normally again. In fact, tomorrow, I may not recognize my own face. And you're asking me if I want a magazine? She backed up, apologized, and walked away. I had nowhere to direct my frustration but upward. How could you do this to me? I stopped myself, remembering wise words of a friend who said, when you're angry, you're weak. I looked right back up and said, thank you for doing this to me and not to my children. I lashed out yet again, but why stage four? Thank you for doctors who can give me hope. But why my tongue of every part of this body? Why my tongue? I had been a professional performance artist, reaching people through powerful stories, so why my tongue? I stopped myself again. I looked right back up and said, thank you for taking a third of my tongue and not a third of my brain. When I started to think this way, I felt this strength begin to well up in me. I looked my cancer in the eye and said, you are not going to squat your ugly face in this vessel because I am going to fight. I awoke in the neurosurgical ICU. My tongue was so swollen, every crevice of my oral cavity was filled to capacity. My mouth was like an overstuffed suitcase. My tongue like a balloon full of air. And suddenly my eyes focused. My brain kicked into action. I rolled my eyes upward and saw my left arm in a cast suspended from an IV pole. I rolled my eyes downward and saw tubes adorning my gown, the largest emanating from my nostril. My left leg was immobile. With my right hand, I crept down my left leg and felt a bandage, the end of which I couldn't explore. And then I focused on signs around me which read, neck should not be moved. Beforehand, we didn't know how much surgery I needed. If the tumor in my tongue was small enough, I would not have needed a reconstruction of a third of my tongue. If the spread to my lymph nodes was minimal, I would not have needed a radical neck dissection. But at that moment, I realized it had all been done. This was the unimaginable made real. One third of my tongue was removed and reconstructed. Tissue from my forearm was used to replace the outside of my tongue and an artery was taken from my arm to feed blood from my carotid to the graft site. Grafts on my leg were used to replace my forearm tissue and build up the density in my tongue. And I needed this neck dissection because lymph nodes cling to that big sternocleidomastoid muscle. And in my case, that entire muscle had to be taken. They found cancer not only, they found cancer in three of my lymph nodes. I was diagnosed at stage four. Fortunately, they left the tip of my tongue intact. And this is what enables me to articulate my speech. I also had a head and neck pathologist working side by side with my surgeon. So every slice taken from my tongue was examined for clear margins before they took another slice. When people hear my story, they feel sorry for me. But I am one of the lucky ones. By the third day in the ICU, I ever a pick well off the other food. And I was moved to a room on the seventh floor of the Guggenheim Pavilion. At 5.30 a.m., the resident doctors were lined up outside my door waiting for their chance to prick my graft to see if blood was falling to the site. It occurred every hour for the next few days. Sounds painful, but I didn't feel a thing. Actually, even today, I would barely feel it. There was a suture 
at the back of my tongue that scraped my throat with every word. I had to contain thoughts, choose words carefully. Would I ever speak articulately again? Would I swallow normally? Would I go back to the work that I loved? I had this more pressing question. Would the thick black thigh hair now grow on my inner wrist? No, but more troublesome was the thought that maybe the black arm hair would now grow on my tongue. Okay, I am someone that takes care of unwanted hair, and I wonder if now I'd have two more areas of unwanted hair to deal with. I finally got up the nerve to ask my surgeon. He chuckled. He said he'd seen it in some men. I knew he was looking at his first female specimen. My husband, he barely left my side. He was so attentive. I just wonder why he can't be like that all the time. <laughs> he constantly urged me to get up and move. But walking was painful. The grafts on my leg would shift with every step. But even scarier was the feeling when upright, my head would just roll off my shoulders. Now that I only had one muscle supporting my head, I needed to relearn how to balance it on my spine. By the eighth day in the hospital, Dr. Erkin said if I could swallow applesauce without choking, I could go home. And by the tenth day, I succeeded. When they removed the cast from my arm, I saw this long curving string, this long curving row of black stitches to a deep red hollowed area, and I turned away in disgust. But I knew it was me now. I knew I had to own it. And I forced myself to look at my arm, and I saw a curving string attached to a red balloon. And I vowed I was going to grab hold of that red balloon because it could only take me upward. The only direction I could go from where I'd been. Six weeks post-op, my speech was returning to normal. I slurred my S's. I had difficulty with some R's. But I worked with a speech therapist to resolve the issue. I could only chew on the right because I didn't, and I still don't, taste or feel on the left. When chewing food, like a delicious deli sandwich, food would spread in my mouth like food does. Well, many years ago, I thought I was chewing the food. My surgeon assured me it would heal, and it did. I got very talented at keeping food only over on the right. At our six-week post-op appointment, I pursued my long-running joke with Dr. Erkin, showing him the thigh stubble that I'm now shaving on my inner wrist. And I asked him if he saw anything back there. And he, with a very serious tone, he looked at me, and he said, well, I'm going to surprise you with what he said. But one thing I knew is that with surgery, every day you feel a little bit better. And when you're feeling better, there's hope. When there's hope, you can go on. We all have a treasure chest of strength within. And sometimes it's hard to find the key to that treasure box. But once we do, I think all the survivors in this room can agree that we had more strength than we thought we had. Once there was a king who had a very large pure diamond for which there was no equal in the world. And one day he noticed a deep scratch on the side of the diamond. He called his most skilled craftsmen to repair the defect. They declined the job, saying it was nearly impossible to bring a diamond back to its original state and the responsibility far too great. 
The king spread word far and wide about the great reward he was offering. An artist in a nearby village took on the project. She gently held the diamond in her hand and turned it, noticing where the shine faded due to the defect. With great confidence, she said to the king, I can make this diamond more beautiful than it was before. The king was impressed with her confidence and entrusted the gem to her care. She admired and respected its integrity. She studied it and noticed where the colors seemed trapped. With artistry, she began to engrave a detailed rosebud above the scratch, turning it into a stem. And when she returned the diamond to the king, suddenly this diamond had more public recognition than ever before. People from all over came to admire the diamond, and the king didn't understand this. When it was in its original pure state, there wasn't that much interest. Why now? So the king, a year later, asked this artist if she knew why there was all this interest. And her answer was, through imperfections emerge unparalleled beauty. We are all diamonds with scars and defects, and it is our challenge to turn what we've gone through into a prism of color that inspires everyone who knows us. I believe that my body didn't have cancer, that I didn't have cancer, just my body did. And having cancer is not a character flaw. So when I was in the hospital, I always tried to keep nurses, anybody in there just a little bit longer, charming them with a joke or a song. Well, one day this aide came into the hospital room and she asked me to get out of bed so she could change my sheets. So I grabbed my IV pole with my left arm cast at an elevator and I hobbled over to my boom box. This was 19 years ago, where I had a cassette tape with my favorite Broadway tunes that made me feel happy. And this perfect tune came out of that box when she was making my bed. Slide some oil to me. Let it slip down my spine. Standing here in one position sure can make one tired. Slip some to my elbow and my fingers if you would. Come on and slide some oil to me, girl. Mm, does that feel good? Well, I was snapping my right hand and shaking my right hip as best I could. And she was dancing around the corner of my bed sheets, tucking them in, saying, you go, girl. <laughs> Feeling as rock bottom as I did, music brought me joy. So when Dr. Erkin was looking in my mouth, he said in a very serious tone, I see two. <laughs> Show it, flow it, long as God can grow my hair. Uh-huh. Well, we did more important things than tweeze at this appointment. Dr. Erkin explained radiation had to begin within eight weeks of surgery, and every week I delayed therapy, I would lose a 5% chance of surviving because the scar tissue begins to develop, and it makes it less effective for the radiation to impact the area. 
The following day, I was in the hospital for prep work. I laid down on this cold, hard platform with a, my head on a neck support, and a radiation therapist came into the room with a warm plastic mesh, like a tennis racket. She placed it over my face to create a mask, and then they tattooed the mask to line me up instead of my facial skin. They bolted this mask down to the table in four places. She left the room and the thick lead door rumbled and shut closed and an alarm went off alerting everyone radiation is about to be administered. And then these thick lead leaves of this IMRT machine began to open and close all around me. Sounded like gunshots. It didn't hurt on the outside. But my insides cried in pain. Cancer therapy can be sometimes barbaric. But sometimes they take you to the worst imaginable place possible, and then you get your life back, and you begin to blossom again. On the last day, well, radiation, I'll tell you a little bit about radiation to the head and neck. I kept thinking I couldn't feel any worse, and I felt worse. It started with blisters lining my mouth and throat, and I used to walk around my home with a spit cup in one hand and a washcloth dangling from my mouth so I wouldn't have to swallow my own saliva. And I thought, radiation can't get worse than this. And it did. My tongue got stiff. My vocal cords stopped vibrating. Blisters lined my entire throat and, and mouth. I, I thought, surely it can't get worse than this. I learned quickly that I could no longer lie down to rest. I have to spend my nights upright which I did in my living room sofa with my head wedged between two sofa pillows. During these long, dark nights, I felt myself begin to wither away from fear, pain, and a lot of loneliness. I thought, surely, radiation can't get worse than this. The worst of it came when my epiglottis stopped functioning and loose saliva at the back of my throat would drip into my trachea and I had severe coughing fits causing the blisters to open and bleed. The only thing that would stop these coughing fits was the heat and steam of a hot shower. I was in and out of the shower throughout the day and throughout the night. I, I tried to keep my sanity while going through the insanity of treatments for oral cancer. One day, I reached that deep, dark place where I made a decision. I had given therapy my best, and I just couldn't go on. And that night, I wrote a note to my husband about where I wanted to be buried and what I wanted written on my tombstone. I felt it was something he shouldn't have to decide. I wrote a letter to my children about my dreams and wishes for them, my pride and joy in them, my values that I hoped would live on. And the following day, I felt it was only fair to tell Dr. Vigneri, my, my radiation oncologist, face to face about my decision. We sat down in his office and he looked at me with gentle eyes and he said, Eva, radiation to the head and neck is the most difficult place of the entire body to tolerate therapy. Is there anything you want to talk about? And in my hoarse whisper, I said, Doctor, I'm quitting. I can't do this anymore. He rolled his chair back. He stood up. He put his arms on his desk. He leaned in close to my face. And I'll never forget the words he spoke. Don't tell me you're quitting. This isn't a game that you quit. It's your life. Find the strength. And 
I stood up. I walked down the hallway and I took another treatment. <clears throat> and another one after that, crying, made my symptoms unbearable. I learned fast to control the tears. I fought ugly thoughts with pretty ones. I replaced all those unhappy endings with happy ones. I dreamed about my future. I watched and read anything that would make me laugh. Laughing was medicine, even if it was only for a moment. The funniest card I read from a friend said, now that you're going through radiation, your husband can say he's married to a really hot babe. The two weeks after radiation are actually the worst. But I remember the moment when I was returning to normal. It was a day when a burp slipped up. And I thought, ooh, I haven't burped in months. After feeling so rotten for so long, something nice was rising from within. On the last day of radiation, my husband took this photograph, and he didn't take the regular route home. I said to him, where are we going? And he said, oh, honey, we are going to celebrate. And I said, no, take me home. I don't feel well. He said, no, your whole life, you've dreamed of driving a convertible. Today, your dream will come true. Pick the color, I'll take you home. I had no energy to argue. I picked the color of green, the sign of rebirth, of new beginnings. My car is 19 years old. It has 243.5 thousand miles on it, and I just can't give it up. Everybody. We missed the song. Oh, well, to life, to life. OK. <laughs> I learned that the letter I wrote to my children is called an ethical will. It is a document that has nothing to do with your material possessions. It has everything to do with your advice, your wisdom, your values that you hope will live on. I inspire all of you while you are well, to write an ethical will for those who love you, something to cherish and hold when you're gone. And certainly for your parents and grandparents, encourage them to do that for you so you have something from them. So it all started for me with this sore on the left side of my tongue. An unusual place for what seemed to me like an ordinary canker sore. After about eight weeks, I went to an oral surgeon complaining of the pain. He examined it, and he said, if it bothers you so much, we can take it off. I said, great, just take it off. Two days later, I was fine. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from his receptionist. She told me my biopsy was negative. I said, are you calling the right patient? And she said, oh, did you have tissue removed from your tongue? And I said, yeah, that was me, but I didn't know you were biopsying it. And she said, well, you have nothing to worry about. And I said, great. I didn't even know I needed to worry. It didn't occur to me to ask her what I should have been worrying about. I was unaware that my biopsy was read by a general pathologist and not an oral pathologist. So the moderate dysplasia was categorized as hyperkeratosis, which is like nothing. So two years go by, and I had no obvious symptoms. But early stage oral cancer is often asymptomatic, and you don't feel it. But the texture and the color of the skin was changing. And finally, when it became painful, I went back to the oral surgeon. And he said to me, Eva, you know, try Oragel. He kept telling me I'm biting my tongue. 
They, they asked me to shave my teeth down. I was bound back and forth between my dentists and my oral surgeons for nine months. They gave me a night guard to wear to protect my tongue from my teeth. Finally, I get this earache because now the tumor is sitting on a nerve to my ear. So I go to my general doctor who looks in my eardrum and tells me I have water on it, prescribes 10 days of antibiotics. I said to him, would you mind looking at my tongue? I said, it's weird, but when my tongue hurts, my ear throbs. He said, sure, open wide. He looked in and he goes, whoa, are you seeing an oral surgeon? And I said, oh yeah, I've seen actually two oral surgeons and two dentists. He said, good, they'll know what that is. Let me take care of the water on your eardrum. After the 10 day days on antibiotics, those earaches did not subside. And I went back to the oral surgery office demanding answers. I said, I can't live like this. We have to do something. And they said, well, hmm, your tongue is small. We don't want to cut it up unless we have to, but I guess the next step would be a biopsy. I got into my car, scheduled one for a week later, and I thought to myself, maybe I should look elsewhere for answers. I called a family friend from New York who was a plastic surgeon specializing in cleft palate. So I figured he'd know what was going on there. He had no idea. He said, head to a major medical center. It didn't even occur to me. I never heard of oral cancer. I, I didn't know you could get cancer in the mouth. So it just didn't occur to me. But when I finally got into New York, I took the bus into Manhattan from Pennsylvania that day, not having an inkling that what I had was anything serious. Dr. Erkin looked at the classic ulceration. He felt the enlarged lymph node in my neck and said, who are you here with? When I woke up from that minimally invasive procedure, he told me I had a squamous cell carcinoma on the lateral border of my tongue. Woozy from anesthesia, I said, is it benign? <clears throat> and he said, you are in an advanced stage of oral cancer. That secretary or receptionist should have told me my biopsy was negative for cancer. If she had used that word, I would have been more aware. I never knew you could get cancer in the mouth. I remember <clears throat> the day that I got home, and the first thing I did when I got home after that biopsy and got the news was cancel upcoming performances. Then we celebrated our daughter Elena's fifth birthday party. And the hardest thing was calling family and friends. On April 15, 1998, when most Americans were filing their tax returns, I was filing medical releases, literally signing my life away. And this one Broadway tune played over and over in my mind. Everybody sing. Wake up, me fondly when we say Remember me once in a while. Please promise me God. when you find that once again you are that can be free. If you ever find a moment, spare a thought for me. When you think you might die, you worry about how you're going to be remembered. When I got home from the hospital, my children, Jeremy, age seven, and Elena, age five, could barely look at me. But I understood because I could barely look at myself. My children shied away from my touch. How could I blame them? I couldn't touch or dress my own wounds. Elena inspected everything I touched very carefully. Mommy, did you take a taste with this spoon? 
No, honey. I just touched it to my lip to see if it was too hot for you. I don't want it. We told her she could get sick from sharing with me, but to no avail. My daughter would stick her tongue out at me. She would ignore me. But one day, <clears throat> she walked by me and kicked my shin. I grabbed her and sat her on my lap and said, Honey, why are you so angry at Mom? What did I do? And she said, Bad Mommy. And she got up and <laughs> ran away. My daughter no longer wanted me to put her to bed. I don't blame her. The coughing, the spitting, oral cancer is very public. You can't hide it under your clothes. But one day she cried out, I want my mommy. I was ecstatic. I got out of bed and I went to her bedside and I rubbed her back like I always do. And I said, honey, honey, it's, it's me, it's mom. But I want my mommy. I, I thought she didn't hear me. I leaned in closer and I took baby doll's hand away from her ear and I said, honey, it's me. It's your mom. She said, but I want my mommy. And I got it. We all wanted the old mom back, but it doesn't work that way. Now it's about getting used to the new mom. When I recovered, two years after I recovered, my daughter hadn't kissed me. I know why. She was very intuitive. She knew she could lose me. And I believe she didn't want to commit to another day of loving me. I took her for therapy when I got better. I, I regret not seeking professional attention during the time of my illness, but we didn't think of it, and nobody recommended it. But when I did finally take her to the therapist, let me just say that nobody knows my daughter as well as I do. She was very competitive with her brother. So one day, I came up with this idea for a game called the smallest kiss in the world. It was a competition between my two children. And I said, who wants to play? And Jeremy said, oh, I'll play, Mom. And he took my head so gently, and he gave me this little eeny, teeny, weeny little kiss. And I said, honey, that was way too big. A lady said, let me try. And she grabbed my head like a football, and she angled it just where she wanted it. And she leaned in. I didn't even feel her kiss on my peach fuzz. And I said, Lainey, Jeremy did a better job than that. And she said, let me try again. She started to ask to play the game. And this is what put us on the road to recovery. When I regained my voice, I wanted my children to know how special they were every single day. You know, I recognize how easy it is to criticize the people we love and need most, our family, our friends, our coworkers, and do we praise them equally, if not more? So I started to do this in a blessing. Why? Even though I questioned my own faith, I wanted my children, I didn't want to rob my children of faith. So I started at night putting my hands on their head and said, thank you for blessing me with my son, Jeremy, who is so conscientious of his friend's feelings, who calls grandma without being asked. And then I'd follow it with something I wanted him to work on, like help Jeremy find the strength to be kinder to his sister, to remember to lift the toilet seat. <laughs> and one day Jeremy said to me, Mom, who blesses you? And I was honest with him, nobody. He was 11 years old at the time. He put his hands on my head, and he blessed me. And I learned something profound. It doesn't matter the age you've attained, the education you've acquired, the profession you practice. You can bless and enrich other people's lives. We also started a 
new ritual in our home for charity. I, I recognized that I, on the outside, I was a great parent. I took them to ballet, piano, museums, play dates, soccer. But what I hadn't done is raise my children with the values I hope to live on. And charity was one of those things I wanted to emphasize. So I bought this beautiful charity box that opened at the top so you could put dollar bills in. And we kept it in a prominent place in our kitchen. In a kitchen drawer, I had an envelope of dollar bills that I would collect. Every time I had a few dollars in my wallet, I would put it in that envelope. When my children came home from school, that charity box was front and center, and I put all these healthy snacks around it, and the kids would drop their backpacks. And instead of saying, how was school today? Because when you ask a general question, you are going to get it right back at you. So I started to ask. No, first I started by taking a dollar out of the envelope and telling my children something I did that day. You know, we all do things outside of our job description that nobody knows about because we have no ritual to share it. And I started to do this through charity by saying, today I called a cancer patient, or today I made a meal for someone down the street who was sick, and I'd put a dollar in the charity box. And then I would ask the children, how did you bring light into someone's life today? Or how did someone bring light into your life? Well, one day Jeremy came home. He goes, Mom, get out the dollar bills. I got a really good one. I said, great, honey. I got it out, and he went first. And he said, Mom, I was the captain of the kickball team. I said, honey, that's wonderful. He said, Mom, I knew who I wanted to choose first. But I chose the kid first who's always chosen last. I emptied the entire envelope of dollar bills because I recognized that it's far more important to raise children who are conscientious of the people around them. I cared much more about that than straight A's. And I encourage all of you grandparents in the room, when you give money for a gift to your children and grandchildren, tell them you have added five extra dollars for charity, and they need to tell you where they are giving that money. And if you are consistent, those grandchildren and children will start looking for the charity before they even get their birthday or holiday check from you. And this is how, together, we can raise a generation of children who recognize that even if you have very little, you still have something to give and make another's life better. <clears throat> Cancer is, as you all know, a family affair. For all of you that are friends and family of a survivor in this room, raise your hand. No way, no how could we have gone through this without you, and I know that you don't feel appreciated as much as you should because people do not understand that being a caregiver is sometimes as difficult, if not harder, than being the survivor. And it is hard to articulate, but you know what, caregivers? It's not about what other people say to make you feel like you're appreciated. Within, you know you are are leaving a legacy. You are leaving a legacy to everybody who knows you about how to be a friend, how to be a supportive family member. Everybody is learning from you. And all of us survivors, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, even though we may not always say it. I'd like to ask everybody out here, how many of you shared your cancer diagnosis with the young children in your life? Okay, so you were brave enough to share it. How many of you were afraid because you thought 
you know what, they're busy, I don't need to bother their busy lives, or they're too young, they won't really understand, or they don't really need to know. How many of you felt anything like that? Nobody? A couple of people? Well, my feeling is that it's, it, it's very important to share it with children because it's an opportunity to teach. And you are robbing children of that opportunity to learn. How else are they going to learn what it means to go through a challenging time and have the support of people who love them? That's how you learn. Share it with them. Don't be afraid. Also, if you don't share it, you're promoting secrecy and dishonesty, and that's not a value that families want to promote. And lastly, if anything were to happen to you, and they found out that you withheld information, they could be forever angry. And that's something that you can never repair if you're not here to repair it. So, oops, went the wrong way. So when I reached my 10-year cancer-free anniversary, I thought, I got a market. How do I do this? And I couldn't think of any better way than to write a book to help children just like my own understand cancer and make it less scary. So this is about what cancer is. And all the doctors who play hide and seek with Mr. C. And of course it says a dentist and dental hygienist look for me hiding under the tongue or in a dark cave of the mouth. An oncologist, see how important I am, Mr. C says? But at the very end of the book it says, let me tell you a secret. Even though I'm here, good things happen every day. Learning, strength, kindness, friendship. My presence brings families together. And there's no medicine more powerful than love. Then I thought, that's not enough. Children need coping skills and communication strategies. So I wrote this next book, Mr. C. the Globetrotter. Children all over the world and how they cope. I mean, my children didn't have the language when I was hurting from the treatments. They didn't know what to say. So I wrote this page that says, when my mother feels miserable from treatments, I say, I'm sorry you're in pain. I'm sorry treatment is rough. I'm sorry you have cancer. And then at the bottom of the page, it asks a question. How do you show sympathy? And it helps children and adults reading the book with them think about how they can help these children. Uh, one day someone said to Elena, pray that mommy gets better. And I thought, that doesn't sit comfortably with me. What if Elena prays and prays and prays and mommy doesn't get better? She'll have no faith. So I wrote this page, my brother has cancer, I pray for courage, strength, friendship, and lots of hugs for our whole family. Now my prayers make a difference. Towards the end of the book, it says, when Mr. C comes to visit, communities bond. Families come together, and everybody learns new ways to cope with life's challenges. There's also an iTunes book. If you've never seen an iTunes book, it's animated and interactive. And it's designed by an oral cancer survivor who can no longer speak. I'd like to give this book to you in a PDF form if you go to evagrazel.com slash testimonial and tell me what you thought of this presentation. It will automatically send you a download of the book. So I felt like I couldn't go on ethically feeling as well as I do without doing whatever it is I could to raise awareness so what happened to me doesn't happen to other people. So I started six step screening, six steps to a thorough oral cancer screening. And on the back side of the card, it lists signs and symptoms of oral cancer. I met a man over here in this room who had oral cancer. If he knew that a lump in the neck that didn't bother him was a sign of oral cancer or difficulty swallowing, he would have been diagnosed four months sooner. 
I believe if dental and medical professionals partner with patients through education, we will catch cancer early. And you know what? When cancer is caught early, it is survivable. It, most of the time, it is treatable. We are educated about skin cancers and the ABCDs and E's. We are educated about breast cancers, but never have I been educated about oral cancer. So I'd like to tell you what an oral cancer screening is because it's imperative that survivors of cancer do a really good job in their mouth with their oral hygiene as well as getting a screening from their dentists. How many of you, raise your hand, if your dentist at a checkup pulls your tongue out with a gauze? Good, and looks at the lateral borders. Okay, and of those who have their hands up, how many of your dentists tell you what they're looking for? Okay, that's the educational piece that's missing. But anyway, that's the first, whoops, that's the first step. The next step is they should be probing the floor of your mouth, which is a high risk site for smokers. They should be palpating your cheek and your lips. They should be making sure the hard palate is hard and the soft palate is soft. And then for oropharyngeal cancer, they should ask you to go ah, and they're looking for asymmetry. If they see one tonsil is larger or more pink, this is a sign that you need to be referred to an ENT. And they should also be palpating your neck. This is called an extra oral exam at your dental office. They should be feeling your neck. So how many of you actually have had your neck felt by your dentist? Nice, okay. Not enough of you though, not enough. That was maybe 6% of the audience. So just to show you, when it's caught early, there's a little lesion on this man's tongue. He had a divot removed from his tongue. He had no chemo, no radiation. This man lives a perfectly normal life and feels everything and speaks articulately. Here's a 29-year-old woman. She had two stage zero squamous cell carcinomas because she was, her dentist said to her, I want you to watch it for change. If you see the tiniest bit of change, you need to get back in here. Guess what? After her first diagnosis, they, she saw some change, went back in, they shaved the side of her tongue with clear margins, they found it again. But now she's six years out, she has two little babies living a perfectly normal life. Screening is just as important as cleaning. Gardasil vaccination, uh, it is the only thing on the market that is gonna bring down this epidemic rise of HPV, human papillomavirus associated oropharyngeal cancers. It's not FDA approved for the oropharynx area, but it's the exact same strain, HPV 16, that causes cervical cancers. And you know, we know a lot about cervical cancers, we know a lot about, about other cancers, but more people die of oral cancer than some of those others. So you already told me how many of you get screened for oral cancer. But know that you can also do a self-exam. When you're at home, you're in your mouth twice a day brushing your teeth, look at your mouth, flip your lips back, Look at your tongue and under your tongue. Get to know your mouth just like you know your skin. And then feel around. Never be afraid to feel around in your lymph nodes. And when you notice something abnormal, get in. You are your best advocate. And I know you all know that in this room. When I was in the hospital, what do you think, or when you were in the hospital, what's the first thing people said to you when they came to visit? How do you feel? Uh, uh. That was a question I didn't want to answer yet again. Every doctor, every nurse, every aide, everybody asked me that question. And when you're in the hospital, you're sick. You don't feel good, and the answer is obvious. So better, you should ask this question. I'd like to bring you a moment of joy. What is it you would like to do at this moment that I'm visiting? And then bring with you what you think that friend would like whether it's a game or a sermon or hygiene or a joke book, and then let them tell you what they would like. Empower the patient. My favorite gifts were 
petroleum-free chapstick because hospitals are very dry. A soft toothbrush is a beautiful gift because you can see the kind of brushes they are still giving out in hospitals today. And if one of those harsh brushes slightly cause a tear in your oral tissue, it can introduce infection and cause more problems. So we need soft toothbrushes in the hospitals, cushy socks with the rubber bottoms, because you know hospitals are really cold. A guest book, because I was so sick I didn't remember who came to visit, and I wish I did remember. And lastly, I love my portable water pick. I take it with me everywhere. It's waterproof. And, you know, it's portable, no wires. And I use it in the shower or wherever I am. The support network. A lot of people said to me, what can I do for you? Frankly, that was sometimes unhelpful because I once said to, to a friend, oh, can you pick Elena up from preschool today? And she said, oh, no, I can only do it on a Tuesday or a Friday. Well, you know what? I was too sick to organize the support network. So if there isn't someone organizing it, ask yes and no questions. I'm making chicken for dinner tonight. Can I make you some? I'm heading to the market. Can I pick you up anything? I'm taking the kids to the park. Can I take yours? And this way, I could say yes or no, and you could handle the rejection. Then, oh, I hope you just said to yourself, that I could do. I could do that. People ask me what I've learned from being a cancer survivor. And I'll bet it's pretty much the same for you. The first thing I learned is that it is not about the length of our life. It is about the breadth of it. That you have far more strength than you think you have. And nobody will take care of you like you. Put the rest of the family aside and take care of yourself first and foremost, so that you can be there for everybody else who needs you and loves you. I was always afraid to accept help from people because I thought, oh, God, no, no thank you, because I was afraid I could never repay all the favors. But one day I realized that by accepting help, it's actually an act of reciprocation. Because by accepting their help, I was giving back at the same time by allowing them to rise up on their ladder of righteousness. As you all know, cancer treatment is a gift because it gives us life. But it's a gift that keeps on giving. Right? So some of you who are many, how many of you are a 10-year uh, or greater survivor in this room? So many of you know that the cancer treatment you may have had 10 years ago affects you today. For me, I take Synthroid for the rest of my life because of, because of compromised thyroid from radiation. I've had three series of hyperbaric oxygen therapy because of the dental work caused in my lower jaw from the lack of vascularity after radiation, among other things. I suffer with zero stomia, although it has gotten better. After my hyperbaric oxygen, my saliva has really increased in production. But I sleep with a spill-proof flip-top water bottle behind my head between two pillows. And during the night when my mouth feels dry, I literally grab that bottle. I don't even open my eyes. I don't lift my head. I don't worry about spilling my glass of water. I, I grab the bottle, I take a sip, moisten my mouth, and I put the bottle right back, go right back to sleep. But for those of you who have dry mouth, there are lots of products on the, on the market, and don't be afraid to try many of them till you find the one that works for you. Dental issues go on and on for me. It's constant. But it's one of the things I've learned to deal with, just like you learn to deal with the long-term effects of your treatment. My hygienist, I am very loyal to her. In fact, if she left the practice, 
I might leave with her because she has educated me. She tells me about all the things that she does. She root planes and enamel scales and perio prevents and biofilms and she does oral cancer checks and floss threading and pocket programming oh, and she cleans teeth. Cleaning is just the end of the service. It's everything else that she provides. I always say you can't spell overall health without oral health. I inspire all of you to really take care of your oral hygiene, especially the survivors in the room. Don't fall behind there because an infection in the mouth is really can be the window to the health of your whole body. So <clears throat> this is my tongue today. My tongue has turned from pale white to pink, a refreshing change for my interior design, don't you think? And you could see all the scar tissue that's still below my tongue, but that's my tongue today. <clears throat> this is my family today. My husband kept his wedding vows through sickness and through health. My children, <clears throat> Elena, became the Relay for Life captain at her university. Jeremy became a freelance photographer. He's now 25, and he, he took this photo of me and sent it into the New York Times, and it was published on a full half page, and it said, this is a photo of my mom, Eva Grazel, a stage four survivor of oral cancer. She travels the world sharing her story and saving lives. When she can, she plans a side trip for inspiration. I said to Jeremy, I love that photo. I want to blow it up into a poster and make a big inspirational ad. And he said to me, Mom, you were the one who told me I couldn't get that good camera yet because I was too young. Well, it only blows up this big, Mom. Sorry. It's all my fault. A lot of people over the years who haven't seen me in a while said, Eva, you look great. But it is not about how I look. It's better to say, Eva, it's great to see you. Because then I know what you meant by saying you look great. But by saying it's great to see you, you're acknowledging what I went through and acknowledging the fact that maybe I wouldn't have been here. Many people ask me if I ever saw my oral surgeon again. And the fact of the matter is, that after I was diagnosed, my husband called up the office and said, by the way, my wife is stage four. I never heard from that office again. I believe that that office admitted more guilt by abandoning me as a patient than by being human and saying, I am sorry. There is a way to say I'm sorry without admitting guilt. They could say, I'm sorry this happened to you. I want to work with you so this doesn't happen to any of our other patients. There is a way to be human. If he was human to me, I would have never sued him. But the fact is, is that both my dentists and my oral surgeons never called me or sent me a card. So we had a lawsuit. And the dentist lived in a different town and I never really saw the two dentists, but the oral surgeon lived in our small community. And my husband and I would see them frequently at restaurants or at the supermarket or, I mean, literally we would do a, a 180 degree turn and avoid each other. But one day, I was at high holiday services in our little town, and the doctor was sitting a few rows behind me. And when the rabbi finished his sermon on forgiveness and how it's important to forgive other people so that you could go on, when I stood up to leave the sanctuary, I couldn't avoid the doctor. I saw him there and there was nowhere else for me to go, so I took a deep breath and I looked up at him and I held my hand up to him and I said to him, Happy New Year, which is what you say at this time of year. 
and he did this. That was it. And I walked past him, and my heart was beating so hard. And I got home, and I, I couldn't concentrate on anything. I couldn't do anything. So I sat down, and I wrote him a letter. I brought that letter to read to you. It says, Dear Dr. G, there's no getting around bumping into each other. We have choices. We can continue to avoid each other causing anxiety, or we can make amends and move past the stress of an unplanned confrontation. After listening to the rabbi's message, I couldn't pretend I didn't see you in the aisle. Reaching out my hand was an opportunity to start the process of forgiveness. I wished you a happy new year instead of saying what really needed to be said. I am sorry for any pain I may have caused you from the lawsuit. This letter is a sincere attempt to soften those hard feelings between us. I know oral cancer can be difficult to diagnose early, especially when the initial biopsy report was misread. After my diagnosis, there was no effort by your office to express concern, interest, or sympathy. Perhaps the influence of your lawyers changed what you would have done or said as a human being. Even though it may not look like it, I continually suffer from the effects of my delayed diagnosis. There's plenty unsaid on both of our parts, but it prevents us from reaching a higher place through forgiveness. When I see you again, I will show you the respect you deserve as a good doctor, a contributing member of our community, and a human being with a good heart and good intentions, as I know all to be true. I signed my name, my address, my phone number, my email. I never heard from him. I saw him in the post office three weeks after I sent this letter. He was in the counter and I had just gotten in line. And when he was done, I stepped out of line and I greeted him. And he was unable to greet me. And then, six months after that, I heard he died of a rare blood cancer. And I didn't know how to feel. So I went to the rabbi. And I said, we had unfinished business. And now what? And the rabbi said, Death atones you of your sins. It's no longer between you and him. Now it's between him and his maker. It helped me to move forward. But I believe that probably in his heart, he really suffered by the guilt he felt, and he just couldn't speak to me about it. And I feel badly that he went to his grave without us making amends. <clears throat> I know that a lot of people look at you because most of you look wonderful and they don't realize what you've been through and they don't realize how you still suffer inside emotionally and physically. And nobody really knows how do you measure quality of life compromises. Well, I can answer that question in a Broadway tune. <laughs> everybody, 600 minutes. Come on, everybody. 525,000 moments of tears. 525,600 minutes. How you measure, measure a year in daylight, in sunset. In midnights, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, in stride. 525,600 minutes. How do you measure a year in life? How do you measure a year in our life? For any of you who want to share my story, there's a free mobile download on the website. And I just want you to know that up here on this table, I have the story legacy. 
for sale along with the books and a storytelling CD. When I was balancing on that tightrope between life and death, I thought good and hard about how I would be remembered. I would be remembered and you will be remembered for how you made a difference in other people's lives. And with that message, I'd like to share with you a folk tale of a young man who gave up his life to save someone else. And when he went to the world beyond, he was asked whether he wanted to reside in the place up above or the place down below. Well, this young guy said, hey, I want to see both places before I make my decision. And first he went down below. And there he saw this big pot of sweet-smelling, bubbling soup in the center of the space. And there were people sitting all around, and everybody had a long-handled spoon, long enough to reach the nutritious soup. But when he looked at the people, they were sick, pale, just miserable. Then he went up above. Surprisingly enough, he saw the exact same thing. There was a big pot of sweet smelling bubbling in the center of the space and there were people sitting all around and everybody had a long handled, long enough to reach the soup up above. He noticed the people were full, they were robust, they were vibrant. The young man wondered, why the difference when both places have the exact same thing? Down below, the people were trying to feed themselves. The handles of the spoons were so long that by the time they got the soup, the soup could never reach their own mouths. Up above, he noticed the people didn't even try to feed themselves. They only fed each other. And when this young man was asked again whether he wanted to reside in the place up above or the place down below, where do you think he chose? So the original version of this folktale, which is 2,000 years old, says he chose to live up above because he deserves to be in a good place. But like some of you, I believe he chose to live down below because there he could make a difference. And so can you. If you share your story with everybody who knows you, you will be leaving a legacy of how to choose courage and choose gratitude and choose moments to cherish. And these virtues that we choose to embody have a rippling effect. They will inspire all, that, all those that know us. And together, we can inspire countless lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to once again thank you for sharing your stories with each other and your families because you are leaving a legacy to the children of this world, the children who can learn from you how to be supportive, how to be a family, and how to be a good friend. When I is replaced with we, illness becomes wellness. I'm gonna be up here if anybody wants to talk to me, tell me their story, I would love to hear it. Thank you, everybody, and many good years of health to you all. Eva, thank you so much for a heartwarming, heart-wrenching story um, with so much important information and a, and a very creative way to convey it to all of us. Thank you very, very much. And I, I try not to do that. I believe some of the books are going to be uh, raffled off to a lucky person later today. So.
Fantastic. Now, uh, Dr. Chowdhury called. She's stuck in traffic, so we're going to have to cancel the uh, gymnastics display. But you can Google it, NCAA National Championships 1983, Dr. Maddie Chowdhury. And uh, Neri Cohen suddenly came down with uh, laryngitis. So I guess uh, it's hard to get good work these days, you know? All right. Now, we've come to the part of the program that is really the reason we're here today, to recognize all of our survivors. I believe there are some young flower. There they are. Are there? She is. All right. Very good. So for the survivors, as I call out each group, if each of you could stand and remain standing until each survivor in the group receives recognition. Okay, so to start. So all survivors who are newly diagnosed within the last year, can you please stand? Yeah, if you stay standing, we can uh, bring in the flower. Watch out for the bonus. Is that everybody? Okay, I think that's everybody within the last year. Next, those uh, diagnosed within the last one to five years, please stand. Thank you. Does everybody have their flower? Did you get a flower? Okay. Okay, please have a seat. So next, five to ten years. Up we go, all right.
Okay. Everybody has a flower. Please uh, have a seat. And now for over 10 to 20 years, please. Or, or 10 to 20 years. 10 to 20 years. So 10 to 20 years. All right, sorry about that. And uh, next, over 20 years. All right, the warriors of the group. Everybody have a got a few more just in the back. Okay, and uh, of course, none of this would be possible without the love and support of our caregivers. At this time, we would like to recognize all of those family, friends, and individuals who have provided love and support to each survivor. To please stand to be recognized. All right, everybody. What a community. Okay, thank you. Just waiting a moment because Dr. Dunnigan is going to serenade us. One of his many talents.
it always works in rehearsal, right? That's not what I said. We just didn't rehearse, that's the problem. All right, thanks everybody for your patience. Things never happen the way you want them, so when it comes to setting up the stage. So, uh, um, I just want to introduce to you a very special person to me. This is my daughter, Kira, my 17-year-old daughter, Kira. I'm gonna embarrass her now by bragging about her a little bit. Uh, she's, uh, she's a wonderful musician. She plays piano, she plays saxophone, she plays the flute. She plays the guitar, and she's playing around the ukulele lately, so she's got all these, all these great uh, talents. And she's a really top student, but as the speaker said today, more importantly, she's a really good soul. And if you ask her buddies, they'd say she's a really good friend. And so uh, we're going to sing a song about being a good friend. Um, one of the great things about... The care that we're able to give in the clinic is that we're allowed to go on these journeys with all of you, the survivors. Uh, and uh, along the way, we really develop what I believe are deep friendships. Uh, uh, and we feel very privileged to be part of your world and your journey. Uh, from the volunteer who meets you at the front door to the front desk person that waves goodbye as you're heading out. So, um, so this is a song. I wrote it about 40 years ago. And then Carol King had the nerve to steal it from me and James Taylor, but I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's You've Got a Friend. Oh. 
search you. Well, take your soul if you let them. Oh, now, don't you let them. You just call out my name. And you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Baby, don't you know that winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you got to do is call and I'll be there. Give another big hand. Come on. <laughs> they were awesome. Here, I think it, whoa, is this not on? There we go. Can you hear me? Nope. Check. No. John, um, do you know how to turn this audio back on? Hello, hello? Hello, hello? No? All right, I can, I can talk loudly. Where's my 15-year-old when I need him to fix the electronics? Okay, all right. Kira mentioned that some of the keys weren't working on the piano, but Kira, I think you did a great job. All right. All right, in the spirit of friends, we have some new friends that we want to uh, acknowledge. In the past... A uh, few years, the oncology program has welcomed six new physicians alone, and you may have met or heard of some of them. Uh, radiation's Dr. Jeffrey Nooner, who is in the house, but not listening. Jeffrey Nooner. All right. Um, Dr. Kruti Patel. Kruti Patel. D Dr. Sarah Fogarty in the Breast Center. In the Head and Neck Center, Dr. Ryan Sobel and Karen Pittman. In the GYN Oncology Department, Dr. Kim Levinson. And finally, the new additions to our practice in medical oncology, Dr. Ari Elman and Rena Patel. So those are the new friends, and it's always bittersweet when we need to say goodbye to old friends to some of our GBMC family members. GBMC celebrated its 50, 50th anniversary last year and has been, that has largely been made successful by some of the individuals who are now retiring. So now to acknowledge some of our long-term staff, I'll introduce Lisa Thomas, the nurse manager of radiation, and Dr. Robert Brooklyn, who's gonna do the magic trip, I, trick, I hope, um, from radiation oncology. Lisa and uh, Dr. Brooklyn. All right. Very nice job. All right. All right. Robert. Okay. Apparently, I'm going first. Let me make this a lot smaller. Um, I have the wonderful um, opportunity to. Um, 
to say, uh, recognize the nurses um, that will be retiring and have retired this year. Um, I've had the pleasure of working side by side with these women uh, to care for our oncology patients. First, I would like to mention Jane Conrad. Uh, Jane worked for GBMC from the day it opens its doors. She helped to plan and open each of the nursing units when the new hospital opened their doors. She became the first supervisor of the nursing, de I mean the um, emergency department, excuse me, and she eventually made her uh, home the outpatient clinic. Um, you all know it as the infusion therapy center. She spent a few years working in radiation oncology before returning as an ad needed position in medical oncology. Jane worked for GBMC for over 50 years. She has touched many patients and families over those years. And if you know Jane, you know I mean touched. She has always had the God-given ability to know when a patient or a staff member was struggling emotionally. She would grab that person, put her arms around them and say, let's talk. And she would go off with them and find a quiet place to talk life over. I'm not sure how Jane got her nickname, Bad Jane, but it's probably for not taking no for an answer when she was fighting for what was right for her patients. Jane, thank you for all you have done for GBMC and many patients and families you have touched over 50 years. to mention Marie Getz. Marie's not here today, but I did want to mention her. Um, she will be um, retiring before the next celebration that we have, so we wanted to recognize her. She's worked for GBMC for over 30 years, and Marie, um, I was going to ask her if she was here today, if she wanted to catch up to Jane, I'd be glad to keep her um, working, but I don't think that's what she wants to do. <laughs> She has worked as an inpatient oncology nurse, but soon found her passion in radiation oncology. She has personally been a mentor for me all of these years. We have worked together side by side for most of that time. Marie is a very kind and compassionate nurse. Her patients love her. Although Marie loves her nursing career, she loves her family, the Orioles, and the Florida Beach just as much. I hope for her that her retirement is everything it, we had dreamed it to be. She had dreamed it to be, and she deserves it, and she will be dearly missed. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Brooklyn, uh, and I'm one of the radiation oncologists uh, who uh, have had, you know, I. I I don't think there would be as many survivors in this room if it weren't for some of the great caregivers that we have at GBMC. And, and if you want to know where the greater comes from in GBMC, you don't have to look any further than the Department of Radiation Oncology. So uh, we're going to, and although Lisa was asked to say some words about Jane and Marie, and so I won't. I, I just, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least also say how grateful the physicians uh, are to the great care that Jane and Marie have given over the years, and so we thank you. Um, but uh, now to turn to, uh, to a uh, really... Um, uh, really sad uh, uh, time for me. It's uh, getting ready to say uh, uh, goodbye to, to Dr. Albert Blumberg after his many years of, uh, of service. Uh, our, our, uh, uh, our keynote speaker earlier today, uh, Ava Gravel, 
uh, introduce one Jewish concept, and that is uh, of forgiveness and atonement. And I'm going to introduce another one because being Sunday, it's, some of us are a little bit more spiritual rather than secular today. And the, the concept I want to introduce is the one of the guiding principles of, uh, of Albert's life, really. And that's the, the uh, concept of tikkun olam, which is repairing the world, making this a better world. And I'm going to give you some examples of how Albert has done this in every aspect of, or in many aspects of his life, starting with, with my department. Albert came to radiation oncology uh, in 1981. The, the, he's one of the founding members of the department. And this department was in the ashes, so to speak. It was prehistoric in, in terms of its technology. And although many people were very much benefited from what we had then, he knew it could be much, much better. And I, I doubt there's been a, a week since Albert came to GBMC that he hasn't worked in some way to make our department better in terms of the best technologies, the best systems, the best people. And, uh, uh, and today we are grateful to Albert for having such cutting edge technologies and great people in the department. But that's just one area. He's also fought for the hospital to be a better place. Uh, and just two examples of that uh, is he's, he's only just relinquished uh, chairing the bylaws committee to make sure that everybody's doing what they should in the right way. And, uh, but also, he, um, he was on the health care board for the maximum permitted amount of years. And that was fighting to have GBMC the best hospital in the community. His work in the state was recognized when he was made president of the State Medical Society. His efforts to make the, the entire field of, uh, of radiation oncology better uh, is exemplified by the fact that he is one of the few radiation oncologists who have asked to become the head of the American College of Radiology. Um, and so at every level, Albert has always fought to make this a better world. And uh, since it will be impossible for him to be uh, replaced, we're just going to have to sadly say goodbye and, and ask him to come back, which I'm sure he will do when the department has its uh, bacon, lettuce, and tomato days, which you can't get at home. And. Uh, and typical of Albert, as he was leaving, rather than arguing him a gift, he went ahead and he and Beth actually made a gift to our department to buy a very generous donation of an endowed fund to make sure that there's always enough monies around for our staff to get the kind of education that they may, they may not be able to get otherwise. So uh, we're just grateful for all of those, uh, for all of those things. So uh, Albert, we are going to miss you a lot. And uh, we, we wanted to thank you. And, and Dr. Nooner is also up here. And he, I'm going to ask him to say a couple things. Yeah. This is how we give speeches now. You dictate it into your phone and read it back. Albert, you're going to be doing this soon. All right, so um, thank you, Rob, for you know, detailing all the things, actually a few of the things, really, that Albert has done. Um, I kind of wanted to come at this from a, a little bit more different angle. You know, I've known Albert now for six years, and in that time, I've come to regard him as both a mentor and a friend. Um, and I was actually asked to sing a silly song about Albert, you know, replace the lyrics of a song with lyrics about Albert, but I felt, you know, I needed to more intimately detail my interpretation of the project called Dr. Albert Blumberg. Um, and, you know, Rob already mentioned a lot of the things he's done in his life, um, and he really has succeeded in the political and administrative realms of medicine while simultaneously being a successful and beloved radiation oncologist and also nurturing a beautiful family. 
And although those are the benchmarks that are often that often encompass a legacy of a physician, um, I want to speak more to the foundation um, of those accomplishments which are really found in Albert's greatest gift, a persistent commitment to caring. You can see it as a colleague when you've had less than a stellar day um, with either a patient or, um, or um, and um, sorry, I've lost myself, um, or a pra another practitioner and he not only gently guides you to a better solution in a future interaction, um, but allows you to come away still feeling successful. Um, you can also see it when you've dealt with an extremely agitated patient, and he has this quiet but deep understanding of the human condition and our role as physicians to recognize and allow the anger that is part of the acceptance process of a horrible diagnosis. Finally, as a colleague who shares an office right next door to Albert, and sometimes hears some heated personal conversations, Beth, I now recognize his constant dedication to his, this caring communication. And it's manifest when, in the middle of a heated conversation, an uptick in his tone and agitation is immediately followed by what can only be described as the recognition of impending doom of a charged interaction in the form of a well-trained pause and a consequent change in his tone uh, to accomplish the goal that he originally established for the communication. Now, Albert is a product of a different era of medicine, one in which physicians uh, commonly acted as little dictators and dispensed paternalistic recommendations. So it is telling that he bought into the now popular social-emotional realm of intelligence and clearly has tried to better himself in a conscious way by incorporating these techniques for effective communication. I'm certain it took some training to learn to steer patients and colleagues comfortably to a decision regarding treatment um, that would ultimately help them. That in the middle of these heated discussions, he still gives that little pause of recognition means that this continues to be a work in progress of value to him. And so by recognizing that moral conviction without personal growth and interpersonal empathy is not sufficient Albert has been immensely successful by working in all three realms. Albert, I've been watching and listening. Uh, I've learned from your reflection the deep understanding of having been an anxious and naive young physician, the overriding duty to have a warm and caring interaction where the patient's needs come first and the recognition that you can always do better, no matter what aspect of your life. If I am able to incorporate this method into the project called Dr. Jeffrey Nooner, our care of our patients can only be improved. Thank you. And as a... Uh, Come on up, big boy. As a token of appreciation for your many long hours and years of work, the staff at the Sandra and Malcolm Berman Cancer Institute are presenting you with your own personal chair. Made in the colors of your home team, it's time to put up your feet, relax, and enjoy retirement. Thank you. Take a second so I can do this without a mirror. Not bad. Ooh. 
Well, I, I am really at a loss for words. <laughs> That's cute, Beth. <laughs> um, uh, Jeff, Rob, uh, thank you for those kind thoughts. But it's really to the people in the room uh, that my heart goes out to because, frankly, if it wasn't for all of you guys, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done at GBMC for the last 36 years. Yes, it's true, I've been president of lots of organizations, local, state, national, but that has only been a sideshow. The real show is taking care of each and every one of you and allowing you the ability to help you not only get well, but to deal with that diagnosis and that shock that Eva so expertly walked us through using her journey as an example. I know that each and every one of you have had similar stories, similar experiences, and to the part that I was able to help make that journey better, I feel that God has truly blessed me, just like he blessed me when I met my wife, because the reason why our kids are as wonderful as Jeff mentioned is because of Beth, not because of Albert. I was never home. Thank you all. Okay, I'd like to introduce one of our newest staff members, Brandon Constantino, who replaced Mindy when she left as the new manager of oncology support. Here to talk about legacy is nothing <laughs> less than a superhero cowboy. That's a long way to go for a stick pony joke, just so we're clear. Um, I guess I'll just acknowledge this right out of the gate. This is a tremendous step down from every other presenter you've had today. Uh, so I want to apologize for that. Um, there's really no getting around it, OK? Uh, but why I'm here is to invite all of you to uh, the 17th Annual Legacy Chase event. Uh, quick show of hands, how many people have been to Legacy Chase before? Yeah. Great. I, my hand has to be down. I've not been before, but I'm going this year, so I'm very excited about it. Um, and what I'd like to do is have all of you guys come, and next year when I ask this question, hopefully dressed differently, uh, we will have everyone put their hands up, which would be amazing. Um, set in Maryland's beautiful horse country, Legacy Chase is GBMC's signature event, uh, benefiting its oncology services and patient support programs. Um, which is the patient oncology support services is the department that put on this wonderful party today. Um, it's a time on our tradition. Horse racing is in Maryland. Um, and uh, the steeplechase event is a much longer course than thoroughbred track races, um, it's w which is normally one to five miles long. And there'll be six separate races that day. This year, as hopefully you'll be able to figure out, the theme is hats, horses, and hope. Uh, so that explains this. Um, the hats, we encourage, we encourage Legacy Chase attendees to wear hats uh, as a symbol of solidarity with cancer survivors. Many patients who go through treatment, they wear wigs, hats, turbans, and hats are a symbol of our um, act of unity with, with survivors. Horses oftentimes are the symbol of riding into battle. They are, all, they are strong animals, they are a symbol of strength, 
and also a symbol of racing towards a cure, all of the things that we hope to do with our cancer. Pro I, it's got to be hard to take me seriously at this point. Everybody, <laughs> I'm looking around and everybody's like really looking at me and I just can't imagine that this is, God bless you people. Um, and, finally, and finally, hope. Uh, and I am not even going to attempt to explain hope. Our speaker earlier uh, explained hope probably about as well as I've ever heard it explained. But uh, it really is what helps us get out of bed when we get bad news, is what gives us faith that good news is on the way. Um, I'm going to read this part because this says important facts. So I'm going to get that right. All survivors and their loved ones are invited to be honorary guests in the survivorship celebration tent. All of you in this room are. Um, the tent is right by the finish line, and it's right by Kids Corner. So if you have kids, it's the perfect spot to be because you'll be right by uh, where they're going to be playing. Um, if you get the chance, please sign up and create your own fundraising page at www.legacychase.org. Um, and also, if you have the opportunity, if you can, um, or if you know people who can, if you can come volunteer, uh, it takes a lot of people to run this event, and it takes just a little bit of help if we can have it. Um, would really go a long way and would really be appreciated. Um, and this is the schedule for the day. Uh, for those of you who are able to attend, uh, we'd love to have you. We're going to have some really good food in the survivorship tent this year, and we're really hoping to see everybody there. All right. Thanks for listening. Now, oh, I don't know. I, I didn't expect anyone to applaud this. i got to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that. Those of you who have found the strength to applaud this. Um, and so now we're going to move on to the part everybody's been waiting for, door prizes. Yeah, isn't that a nice way to round this out? And here to draw them are two GBMC survivors, Nancy and Sandy. So if you thought Brandon's part was bad, you haven't seen nothing yet. So there we go. You're first. <laughs> Eva, as a tongue cancer survivor, I want to say you really, really inspired me today. But more importantly,